Let's now join together in reading God's Word. So God speaks to us this morning from Luke 1, the verses 39 to 56. So the words we read at this time will also serve as our text for this morning's sermon. So turn with me to the Gospel according to Luke, starting at verse 39 of chapter 1. In those days Mary arose and went with haste into the hill country to a town in Judah, and she entered the house of Zechariah and greeted Elizabeth. And when Elizabeth heard the greeting of Mary, the baby leaped in her womb. And Elizabeth was filled with the Holy Spirit, and she exclaimed with a loud cry, Blessed are you among women, and blessed is the fruit of your womb. And why is this granted to me that the mother of my Lord should come to me? For behold, when the sound of your greeting came to my ears, the baby in my womb leaped for joy. And blessed is she who believed that there would be a fulfillment of what was spoken to her from the Lord. And Mary said, My soul magnifies the Lord, and my spirit rejoices in God my Savior, for he has looked on the humble estate of his servant. For behold, from now on, all generations will call me blessed. For he who is mighty has done great things for me, and holy is his name. And his mercy is for those who fear him from generation to generation." He has shown strength with his arm. He has scattered the proud in the thoughts of their hearts. He has brought down the mighty from their thrones and exalted those of humble estate. He has filled the hungry with good things, and the rich he has sent away empty. He has helped his servant Israel in remembrance of his mercy, as he spoke to our fathers, to Abraham, and to his offspring forever. And Mary remained with her about three months and returned to her home. So as I mentioned, this morning's message is based on what we have read together already, Luke 1, the verses 39 to 56. Brothers and sisters of our Lord Jesus Christ, the singing of psalms and hymns and spiritual songs is a very important element in the worship of God's people in the Old Testament as well as in the New Testament. The church of the covenant Lord of the Old Testament and in the Christian church of the New. Think, for example, of what we just sang. Let all the earth with loud rejoicing burst into song to praise the Lord. A key thing to recognize with such singing, is that it is worship. It is our response to God's Word to us. It is our reaction to God's gospel of free grace and salvation. Thus, singing is a form of prayer. It's a biblically sanctioned prayer in which we adore and confess and give thanks and offer supplication to our God. Think of also what we read in the book of Colossians chapter 3 verse 16, let the word of Christ dwell in you richly, teaching and admonishing one another in all wisdom, singing psalms and hymns and spiritual songs with thankfulness in your hearts to God. And then Paul continues in Colossians 3, verse 17, and whatever you do in word or deed, do everything in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through him. You see, worship, as it is also reflected in our singing, goes together with committing our lives and service to God. Desiring to serve the Lord Jesus Christ is a combination 
of worship with our lips and our minds and our hands and our feet with all our life. And that, beloved, all of that is now reflected, is coming out of our text in the responses of Elizabeth and Mary to the gospel news of salvation. The events of our passage are bringing together in a preliminary way the two children of promise. The promise of the mediator and his forerunner. And that happens in our text through the meeting of the two mothers. Just like the lives and ministries of John and Jesus will cross in adult years. We read in our text how Mary, after the angel has made the announcement to her, sets off to visit Elizabeth, having heard the news of her pregnancy. No doubt Mary can't wait to tell her cousin of the angel's visit and announcement and to hear more about Elizabeth's story in turn. And as that meeting takes place, these two women break forth in song. So we hear God's message this morning following this theme, singing about the blessing of salvation through the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. That's how we summarize the message, singing about the blessing of salvation through the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. And we'll see two things, Elizabeth's song and then Mary's song. So first, the song of Elizabeth. Elizabeth, when Mary arrives to her home, responds. She responds to several revelations of the mercy and goodness of God. First of all, as you know, she is expecting a child, a boy, even though she and her husband Zechariah are well along or well advanced in years. The Bible even describes her as barren. And each day that goes on, as the life in her womb increases, as the baby bump grows, as she now undoubtedly begins to feel the baby moving within her, kicking, she is filled with joy and wonder at this amazing work of God. Secondly, the child that she is expecting is going to be a special child. He is going to have a special calling. He is the gift of God. That's what John means. And he will be filled with the Holy Spirit from birth, it says in chapter 1, verse 15. Luke writes how Gabriel declared to Zechariah that John will be the one to announce the arrival of the anointed one. He is going to be the forerunner of the Messiah. He is the fulfillment of the prophecy of Malachi, which we read in, in Malachi earlier, but is quoted in verse 17 of chapter 1. He will go before him in the spirit and power of Elijah to turn hearts of the fathers to the children and the disobedient to the wisdom of the just to make ready for the Lord a people prepared. Her son is going to bring about a great renewal. In the fulfillment of his calling, there's going to be regeneration in the land. And for almost six months, Elizabeth has been carrying this news in her heart. Third, as our text unfolds, we read how she hears the voice of greeting from her relative Mary. And at the very moment of her greeting, the Lord reveals to her by the Holy Spirit that Mary is the one who is going to give birth to the promised one. The very one whom her son John is going to announce and proclaim as the Messiah is the child that Mary is carrying in her womb 
and who is coming through her doorway. All of this and more is behind Elizabeth's joyful response, her her bursting into song in her text. Brothers and sisters, think about what is happening. And then I, I ask you to think about it, imagining some of these circumstances if they were happening today. And then I mean just unusual, but yet normal circumstances. So imagine if there is an older woman, for example, in her late 40s or early 50s, who is expecting a child. And she has a relative, a niece, a daughter-in-law, or maybe a daughter who is much younger than her and is also expecting a child. It's a rare occasion, but these things have happened. When both a mother and and a daughter or a daughter-in-law are expecting a child together at the same time. Imagine that this younger mother-to-be has traveled some distance, has come over to the older woman's home unannounced for a surprise visit and calls out in greeting to her coming through the door. You can imagine what sort of meeting or greeting that would be. How exciting that would be for those two women. What pure joy they would experience. It's an unusual situation, and thus hugs and tears and shouts of joy are all around. Well, how much more then in our text should this be in this most unusual meeting where there is an aged, expectant mother, one who had been called barren, who will one day give birth to a child who will be called John the Baptist, who will preach and teach the coming of the kingdom, and who will announce and even point out the Messiah. This old Elizabeth, soon to be Mother Elizabeth, hears the greeting of and the meeting of her relative and friend Mary, who happens to be expecting that very child, that promised one, that Messiah, who is going to be born, that deliverer, who is going to one day be called the Lord Jesus Christ. And though she doesn't know the details, knows he will bring salvation, which we know happened when he lived in obedience and died on the cross for our sins, For the whole world who bore the great wrath of God against sin to save us. Indeed, how much more then are Elizabeth and Mary going to break out in song? And in addition to all of this, we read in verse 41, when Elizabeth heard the greeting of Mary, the baby leaped in her womb. Is this the working out of what is promised in chapter 1, verse 15, when the angel Gabriel says that John will be filled with the Holy Spirit even from his mother's womb? Is this John already prophesying, helping Mother Elizabeth to understand that Mary is the mother of the Lord, that the one Mary is carrying in her womb is the Messiah? These physical movements of the unborn John surely point to the public ministry he is going to have of announcing the good news of Jesus' arrival as servant king of Israel. At the same time, we must be careful not to say more than is found in our text. In the least, we are reminded here, we are taught here, that the baby in a mother's womb just over, in this case, just over 20 weeks old, is truly a distinct person and can already hear and feel and react to the real joy of his mother. What our text says is that Elizabeth herself 
is filled with the Holy Spirit and goes on to declare Mary as the mother of our Lord. Recognize here the beginning of the fulfillment of the prediction of Joel that in these last days, all of God's people, including ordinary, even old people, would engage in prophesying by praising God joyfully and boldly telling other people about the Christ. The very conception of the Son of God is enough to trigger the beginning of this age of salvation in songs of praise to God's saving power in Jesus. The Lord uses the movement of Elizabeth's child to add to and underline the wonder and the joy of this moment. And therefore, Elizabeth breaks out in responsive song, a hymn of praise to God. Now maybe you are thinking, it only says in our text that Elizabeth exclaimed with a loud cry. I would say to you, same diff. The word in the original here means to speak with considerable volume, to shout, to cry out. And in the Bible, including in the book of Psalms, we read a lot about shouting out loud as a form of song. In the context of singing, shouting is singing. Oh, what an enthusiastic, joyful sound that comes forth from Elizabeth's lips. She declares through the Spirit the blessing of salvation through Jesus Christ. She declares how Mary is blessed among women chosen to bring the special wonder of life in this world. She declares how this child, too, is also blessed. Mary is further blessed to believe what God was accomplishing in her. Elizabeth sings. Here, blessing means happy, but it's more than a feeling. It's, it's not merely what a person feels, but what a person is. Blessing is the result of God's favor resting upon a person. Blessing is the theme of Elizabeth's song. And brothers and sisters, that must be the theme of our singing too. We can take that from our message this morning, from our passage, that we also are called in this age of the Holy Spirit, in this age of Pentecost, in this age of the fulfillment of Joel, to be filled with exuberance and joy. As stated earlier, we have, we know more than what Elizabeth knows, what she has experienced. We now have, through the Holy Spirit, the whole story of God's redemptive work and salvation in Jesus Christ. We have the working of true faith in our dead hearts. We are living in the age of the Holy Spirit. So let us not hold back in our praise to God for his saving grace. Let us too burst forth in song. Let the mouths of believers even Reformed believers, be filled with thankful shouts of praise every day where God and his salvation and the blessing of it is the theme of our songs. And that is also true of Mary's song, and we'll see that now in the second place. That Mary, like Elizabeth, is also responding to God's revelations of grace and mercy in her life. Think about what she has heard and experienced. First, she's heard from God's glorious angel that the Lord is going to use her to bring the promised Messiah into the world. 
Secondly, it's going to happen in a miraculous way when a virgin, through the overshadowing of the Holy Spirit, brings about the conception so that the child in her, the angel said, would be holy without sin and at the same time be called the Son of God. Third, she's told by the angel that her relative Elizabeth is expecting a child as well. She who was called barren, who was well advanced in years. Fourth, after a long journey, she has arrived at the very house of her beloved relative and hears it confirmed from her relative's lips that there really is life in that old woman's womb. And then finally, Mary hears from Elizabeth's lips wonderful prophetic words and that Mary would recognize that those words of Elizabeth are not hers alone, but more importantly, are those inspired by the Holy Spirit. Yes, God has been working wondrously in Mary's life, and she is experiencing in fullness the goodness of God, so she too breaks forth in song again. We note in our passage that it says Mary said. That's how it begins. Her words begin in verse 46. How can we call that a hymn of praise? Well, beloved, the words that she is using show that her heart is filled to overflowing with thanksgiving. Her words are resembling, are imitating words that she had known from the Old Testament scriptures, such as the songs of Miriam and the song of Hannah. First of all, we read that her soul magnifies the Lord. Literally, that word means to praise the greatness of someone, to make someone great. She is proclaiming the greatness of Yahweh, her Lord. In the Latin version of the New Testament, the Vulgate, that word is magnificat. And many a composer, such as J.S. Bach, have written concertos with this name, magnificat, based on these words of Mary. Second, we read in verse 47 that her spirit rejoices in her God, in God her Savior. Well, here, if we look at a lexicon, a dictionary, then we read that this word means to experience a state of great joy and gladness, often involving verbal expression and appropriate body movement to be extremely joyful, to be overjoyed, to rejoice greatly. What, th what this means is that Mary has literally burst into song and dancing for joy that is in her. Mary's entire being, not just her lips, but her body, her soul, are being caught up in praise to God. And then even more than all of this that is remarkable is the content of what she is saying or singing. She rejoices in God who has shown favor to her personally. It's the same mercy, she says, the same favor that is going to be shown to all those who believe in God. She exclaims God's favor on all Israel, on all believers. The fulfillment of God's covenant promises to his people. Throughout history, God has performed mighty deeds with his outstretched arm, she sings. He has revealed justice against the enemies of his people, but has raised up in mercy the people who are his own. 
He has scattered the proud, but he gathers up the lowly. He blesses the downtrodden and the persecuted, the weak and the poor and the humble. Whereas Elizabeth's song is more grounded on experience and feeling, which is perfectly legitimate, Mary's song is founded upon God's word, upon theology. Not only does Mary give account of God the Father and His providential care, not only does she explain Christology, that is salvation through Christ, but she also proclaims eschatology, that is, she teaches about the future life. In verse 54 and 5 we read, He has helped His servant Israel in remembrance of His mercy as He spoke to our fathers to Abram and to his offspring forever. In other words, what has happened again and again in the past, in the numerous times in the Old Testament age, what has happened and will happen in Jesus Christ in the New Testament, beloved, will continue forever under the eternal kingship and rule of Jesus Christ. God's promise will hold firm forever, she sings. Mary is confessing her faith in the mighty and merciful God, the Holy One, the helper in time of need, the God of the covenant, the one whom she calls my Savior. And so should we. So should we be filled with thankful praise for all of God's love and faithfulness that he has shown to us. So should we burst forth in song based on the solid theology of God's Word and His promises. Let's not hold back, beloved, as we learn about God more and more. We read that Mary remained with Elizabeth about three months in order to bask in this wonderful truth and confession. Perhaps she, she stayed with Elizabeth in that in that experience of faith, even to the time when John was born, and then went home, back to her home, back to her betrothed, to prepare for the greatest event of all, the greatest event of redemption, when she would give birth to God's one and only Son, our Savior. And she went back, undoubtedly, with a song in her heart, with a song on her lips, with song in her steps. In conclusion, we see that the song of elderly Elizabeth is filled with spontaneous joy and rapturous shouting for the fulfillment of prophecy is revealed in the arrivals of John and the coming Christ. The song of modest Mary is highlighted by a description of a deep covenantal theological truths concerning God's justice and mercy as revealed in Christ. Both are fitting ways for believers, even reformed believers, to praise God in song. Yes, may we all shout out. May we all exclaim. May we all confess and sing to God in body and soul with heartfelt praise. Amen.